What do you call a teacher that forgot to take attendance? Absent-minded. Hey, I'm Raquel, and along with 240, I help teachers pass their certification exams. And today, I'm gonna help you. This video is going to prepare you for the MTLE Pedagogy Elementary Subtest 2. This video is gonna cover three things, what's on the test and how to study for it, the most likely concepts that will be on the test, and we're gonna look at a few practice questions. There is a subtest one for this exam, which we covered in a previous video. Check that out if you haven't already. Today is part two, and we're taking our skills to the next level. Now, subtest two is just like subtest one in that it consists of approximately 50 total questions coming from two overarching sub areas. The sub areas are instruction and assessment and professional roles and responsibilities. Each sub area is worth about 50% of the exam. This means you'll see about 25 questions from each. You'll find three objectives within each of these two sub areas. In sub area one, we have understanding various types of assessment and relationships among assessment, instruction, and learning, understanding instructional planning procedures, and understanding how to use a variety of instructional strategies to provide effective and appropriate learning experiences. Sub area two covers understanding how to communicate and interact effectively with families, colleagues, and the community, understanding professional development opportunities and resources, and understanding the historical and philosophical foundations of education, the rights and responsibilities of students, parents or guardians and educators, and legal and ethical guidelines for educators in Minnesota. Whew, this may seem like a lot, but don't worry. 240 helps break it down. In this video, we'll do a flyby, but click the link below for a full test aligned study guide. Let's look at the first objective within sub area one. This sub area focuses on different teaching strategies from the planning to the instruction to learning assessment. As its too long name suggests, our first objective is all about understanding various types of assessment, instruction, and learning. Assessment is a major component of education as a whole, as well as the specific day-to-day -day role of an educator. It will also likely be a significant part of your exam. Assessment is more than just giving tests and taking grades. You should be familiar with important terms regarding types of assessment. Keep in mind, assessments may be criterion referenced or norm referenced. You may be wondering what those terms mean. Let's break them down. Criterion referenced assessments compare student performance to a predetermined standard, which is a criteria. Scores on these types of tests come in the form of a percentage. Tests administered at the end of an instructional unit and state achievement tests are common examples. Norm referenced assessments compare students to each other and rank them according to performance. Scores on these types of tests come in the form of a percentile, grade level equivalency, or stanine using a normal bell-shaped curve. Common examples include the SAT test or IQ test. In other words, criterion referenced assessment looks at how students perform against a set criteria. Norm referenced assessment looks at how students perform against the normal curve. Take a look at some other key terms and ideas, such as universal screener, diagnostic assessment, pre-assessment, informal assessments, formal assessments, formative assessments, and summative assessments. Feel free to pause this video here to add 240's definitions to your notes. Nice job. Now let's head to level two of our study session. That's objective two, understanding instructional planning procedures. This objective delves into effective planning methods to design classes promoting learning and achievement for all students. Let's back up a step. A typical school day is split into chunks of time, each focused on a particular subject. Students benefit from this practical and predictable routine. However, this structure can keep students from seeing how subjects are interconnected. This is where interdisciplinary instruction comes into play. Interdisciplinary instruction integrates multiple subject areas by putting them together. By integrating subjects, teachers can provide students with a broader understanding of content and develop their awareness of the ways in which knowledge and skills can be utilized between subjects. Interdisciplinary instruction benefits students in many ways. 
It draws on motivation from different subjects, makes learning meaningful and relevant, prepares students for real life, fosters critical thinking and collaboration, and provides greater appreciation of the value of all subject areas. One way to approach this is to create thematic units, which are units of instruction with an overarching theme or topic. Let's look at an example. Imagine you are working on a rainforest thematic unit. How would you incorporate this into every subject? Science, teach lessons about the rainforest ecosystem. Social studies, identify regions with rainforests on the globe. Math, interpret graphs on annual rainfall. Language arts, write about the rainforest. Another level down. Good news, we're almost done with sub area one. Level three, I mean, objective three, is understanding how to use a variety of instructional strategies to provide effective and appropriate learning experiences. Some of the most powerful instructional strategies start with the same resource, technology. Our world is becoming more and more digital, a fact that can be used to a teacher's advantage. The following applications can be assessed and used with devices such as computers or tablets. Databases. Many schools or districts provide student databases to store and organize student information, including assessment results. Teachers can apply filters to quickly access the needed information. Record keeping. Many teachers use digital tools for record keeping. This simplifies the process of tracking and recording things like attendance and grades. Learning Management Systems, LMS. Teachers may use learning management systems to create and deliver digital content. These platforms can be used for both virtual and in-person learning, as well as assessments with instant scoring and feedback for students. Collaboration software. This allows teachers to share and work on files together, making comments and tracking changes on their own time, while still working together to meet a common goal. Multimedia presentations. Teachers may use multimedia presentations to enhance their lessons with audio and visual components. Not every lesson needs to be as flashy as a movie or video game, but the proper use of multimedia in the classroom can help capture and hold student attention. Supplemental programs. These can provide extra practice or resources to continue learning outside the classroom. Teachers should be open to student input about digital resources that could be beneficial for class. Congratulations, three down. That's an entire first sub area. Don't pause this learning game yet though. It's time for sub area two, professional roles and responsibilities. This sub area is about excelling in your role as an educator, as well as the role of education in general. It makes up about 50% of the exam or approximately 25 questions. As a reminder, sub area two covers understanding how to communicate and interact effectively with families, colleagues, and the community, understanding professional development opportunities and resources, and understanding historical and philosophical foundations of education, the rights and responsibilities of students, parents, or guardians, and educators, and legal and ethical guidelines for educators in Minnesota. Let's kick off these new levels with understanding how to communicate and interact effectively with families, colleagues, and the community. It's important for teachers to foster positive relationships with students' families. Plant the seed for a positive relationship to grow from the start and tend to it regularly throughout the school year. This idea can be split into two categories, beginning of instruction and throughout the year. At the beginning of instruction, parents should receive background information on a teacher, such as your school phone number and email address, your background, why you like to teach, and or anything else you feel comfortable sharing. It's natural for parents to want to know about who is responsible for their child's education. On the flip side, you'll need the parents' contact information too, as well as their preferred method of communication. Other things you should share include general classroom information and clear expectations for academic performance. Throughout the year, teachers should keep families up to date with what students are learning and working on. Progress reports and report cards can also communicate student progress and performance to parents, though sometimes more frequent communication is needed. Parents do not want to be surprised by anything concerning that shows up on an official report. Make them aware of your observations ahead of time, along with ways you're trying to help. 
parents will appreciate this. Teachers should also share ways for parents to be involved in their child's education, such as ideas to reinforce concepts at home or volunteer opportunities. And remember, parents should feel comfortable enough to reach out to teachers throughout the year. Another level done. Let's flip to the next objective, understanding professional development opportunities and resources. This skill is all about player one, our main character, you. What strides can you take to develop your career? Teachers should be lifelong learners. Makes sense, right? The field of education is continuously evolving and there is always something new for teachers to learn or improve upon. That's where professional development comes in. Teachers have many different opportunities for both in-person and online professional development, such as classes, conferences, workshops, in-service training, books, articles, and academic journals. Teachers should ask themselves these questions to determine what topic to choose. What areas of my teaching practice could I improve? What will have the greatest impact on students? Teachers can be great resources for each other. Many schools pair new teachers up with mentor teachers, and even experienced teachers can learn from each other. Knowing who to turn to for help or inspiration is a valuable professional development tool. One last thing to remember, all types of professional development should all have one thing in common. It should always be research-based. Whoa, you are winning this game. Ready to finish up with professional roles and responsibilities? Let's go. Our last concept is understanding the historical and philosophical foundations of education, the rights and responsibilities of students, parents and guardians and educators, and legal and ethical guidelines for educators in Minnesota. Kind of a mouthful, huh? This objective is all about ethics and responsibility. In most states, teachers are required by law to report any suspected abuse or neglect of a student. Laws in your state may dictate a window of time in which the report must be made to appropriate authorities, what person is responsible for making the report, some states specify that the reporting responsibility cannot be passed off to another individual, such as an administrator or counselor, and penalties for failing to file reports of abuse. There are many signs of abuse to look out for, such as a student who seems withdrawn or depressed, seems afraid to go home or wants to run away, shies away from physical contact, acts aggressive, has sudden and drastic changes in behavior, wears clothing that covers their whole body even in the warmer months, though remember, this could also be a cultural practice and have nothing to do with abuse, or has unexplained burns, cuts, bruises, and or broken bones. Good news. You've completed the professional roles and responsibilities sub-area, which means you've also completed all of the objectives for this subtest. Way to ace the main quest of today's video. Great work. I understand how overwhelming this can feel, but remember, you've got this. And we at 240 are happy to be your player too. Speaking of which, you may think the game is over, but not quite. We've got a bonus level for you. Practice questions, which will give you a sense of what you might encounter on the exam. Together, we'll tackle one question related to each objective we covered in sub-areas one and two. You can do this. Oh, and if you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. You can also subscribe to 240 and get all the practice questions you need to be 100% confident for the test. Ready for your practice questions? Let's go. We'll begin all the way back at our first objective, types of assessment. Which of the following represents a criterion reference score? A, a ranking that indicates percentile rank on a standardized test. B, a raw score on a state mandated test that indicates the number of correct answers. C, a stanine that indicates where a student falls on a bell curve or D, a score that indicates how well a student understands the specific content on a project. Define the terms criterion referenced and norm referenced in your head. Keeping those in mind, the correct answer is D. 
A criterion reference test compares the score to what a student should have mastered after being taught a set of information. Most classroom tests and quizzes created by a teacher are criterion referenced. Great start. Now let's think about understanding instructional planning procedures. The fourth grade team would like to plan an interdisciplinary unit themed around urban areas. Which of the following would be the most appropriate first step in planning? A, reviewing relevant content standards for each subject area. B, assigning individual responsibilities for each teacher to contribute to the unit. C, identifying instructional resources the team can use. Or D, creating a graphic organizer to list ideas related to the theme and subject areas. Well, now I've got to ask, thinking about our lesson on interdisciplinary connections, what would you do first? Got your answer ready? Good. The correct answer is A. The first step is to review which content standards will be covered in the unit. No other steps can be completed until this is done. Nice job. Okay, this next question will cover using a variety of instructional strategies such as technology. Let's set the scene. Students in third grade are studying 2D and 3D shapes. The teacher wants to use technology to support students' understanding of geometry. Which of the following is the most appropriate and effective use of technology for this purpose? A, demonstrating how to search online for geometric pyramids and the real life example of the Great Pyramid. B, allowing students to play Tangram games on tablet apps. C, having students explore a website that allows users to construct and deconstruct 3D figures using 2D figures. Or D, finding an online database with pictures of various shapes that students can use as a resource. Let's really consider these answers. All of them include technology as a teaching aid. However, only one answer aligns with the teacher's original goal. And that answer is C. This interactive website allows students to make academic gains within the content area. You're knocking these bonuses out. Three down, three to go. We're moving on to sub area two now. Which of the following would show effective collaboration between a parent and a teacher? A, a teacher creates a behavior chart for a struggling student and the teacher and parent both sign it each day. B, a parent gives a gift at the end of the first semester and the teacher sends a thank you note. C, a teacher and parent exchange emails about a student who is at risk of failing. Or D, a teacher sends home a positive note about a child who's been participating more than usual. Okay, the key word here is collaboration. Though these are all positive interactions between a teacher and a parent, only one of these choices is a true collaboration. Got your answer ready? The correct choice is A. In this scenario, the teacher and parent are working together to help the student. Don't stop now. The end of the game is in sight. Let's move on to understanding professional development opportunities and resources. Mr. Tomlin is a first year teacher who wants to improve his classroom management. Which of the following would be the best strategy for Mr. Tomlin to improve his classroom management skills? A, use online resources to find the best classroom management techniques. B, discuss his current strategies with the principal and ask the principal for guidance in improving his classroom management skills. C, observe the classroom management abilities of other first year teachers or D, observe experienced teachers in the classroom and discuss classroom management skills when students leave the class. Before answering this question, consider, in which choice can Mr. Tomlin see how the strategies are implemented? The answer is D. All right, here's our last question. Mr. Smith notices that one of his students, Andrew, is having trouble sitting down and constantly shifts his weight during class. He asks Andrew if something is wrong, and Andrew replies that his thigh is bruised because his father hit him, but he asks Mr. Smith not to tell anyone because he's embarrassed. Mr. Smith suspects the student might be abused. Which of the following is the best response to the suspicion? A, Mr. Smith should contact the campus administrator about the situation, as well as Child Protective Services. B, Mr. Smith should monitor the student to see if he shows up with more bruises or symptoms of abuse. 
C, Mr. Smith should honor the student's wishes and not tell anybody about the situation. Or D, Mr. Smith should contact the father of the student about the situation. Situations like this can be tricky, but the best answer is always A. This is the best route and is the legally required route. Hear that? It's the sound of the game powering down. Hopefully now you've got a sense of the kind of assessments you'll face on this test. Congratulations, you made it through. Thanks for sticking with me from start to finish. If you found it helpful, give it a like. There's still plenty more to learn. Thousands of teachers have passed their certification exams by using our study guides. If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the MTLE Pedagogy Elementary Subtest 2, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guide. It has hours of videos so you can watch and or listen while doing chores. It is test aligned so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions so you can be sure you're ready. And it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started.